what I'm doing now will it be one tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that your coming will not be in vain, that the word of God will have power, impact, penetration into your life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name. We thank you because you brought us together so you can reveal your mind and give us the revelation of heaven. We pray tonight you expound, you expand, and you instruct us in your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that the fire in the word, the power in the word will quicken us and make us alive to be the man, the woman, the leader, the worker, and the minister we are to be in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the whole church said, Amen. God bless you. You can see now. We're coming to Matthew chapter 1. I was looking at verse 21, Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 21. Here is good news. The good news that the whole world, from the beginning of creation to that time, they have been waiting for. Here is good news. The good news that God himself spoke about at the beginning in Genesis, when Adam and Eve fell, and they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Peace, the Garden of Joy, the Garden of Pleasure. Here is the good news that comes to us that all the prophets have been thinking about. All the prophets have been examining, requesting, when will this happen? They read all those prophecies in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that somebody is coming. And when he comes, it will bruise the head of the devil. When he comes, it will cleanse and totally take away all the consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve. And they were looking and expecting, when we see, when will he come? And all of a sudden, an angel came from heaven and appeared unto Mary and said, Hail Mary, you are favored above all all women and then gave her the news and Mary said how shall this be because I never knew a man it was her this Mary virgin Mary that the prophecy of Isaiah will be fulfilled on her it had been given about 700 years before that time and here came the D-Day and the moment when that prophecy will be fulfilled and eventually the angels appeared and they glorified God and they said glory to God in the highest and peace on earth because to you is born this day in the city of David the Savior Jesus Christ and then those shepherds they ran quickly to that place to go and see what they were told of and when they got there how happy they were how joyful they were and they left and they went and told all the people that they met today we're looking at the very message of the angel unto Joseph about Mary look at your Bible Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 and she shall bring forth a son she shall bring forth a son that that's a, you know a unique son a son that is universally going to bless the rest of the world she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus you will not pull out any name like the Jewish people I call him by the name of my father by the name that I like this one will have a name that is already registered in heaven before he was conceived thou shalt call his name Jesus that means Jehovah saves Jehovah is the Savior the Lord is Savior for he shall save his people from their sins in the Old Testament all the priests that served and ministered in the temple they still had their own sin and so they'll make sacrifice for their own sin the priests were sinful but he shall save the priests from 
their sins. As you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, it wouldn't take you long reading. You will know that those prophets, they arch their sins. They were not free from sin all the time. But then he will come, and for he shall save the prophets from their sins and there you find the parents the parents uh, all over in Israel men and women you've read about them and you've seen their deficiencies you've seen their iniquities you've seen their sins they could not be free from sin in fact even you know as parents do parents will tell lies even to their own children you know when a child is uh, crying uh, the parents will say police is coming police is coming and the police will get you and grab you now and they have been telling lies to their children from the young age but then those parents when Christ comes he shall call he shall come and he shall save those parents from their sins and then the poor people all those poor people in the land uh, they gave excuses that you know because we're poor if we don't uh, sin if we don't do this are we going to make it in life but those poor people he shall save the peace signs from their sins the rich people too were there and all those pe rich people like Zacchaeus they will go into sin but it will save the prosperous people out of their sins. All the people, young and old, men and women, the purpose of Christ's coming is that when he comes, he is a savior, he is the redeemer. He will save his people from their sins. Look at that word from. As you look at the word from, it's like when somebody falls into a well. If he remains in the well, it's not saved. If it is still crying in the well and drinking the dirty water in the well, it's not safe. But when you throw down a rope, he grabs that rope and you pull him out of the well. The well is separated from him. He is separated from the well. Then he is saved. Think about sin like a well of dirty water. A well of poisonous water, a well of uh, degrading water, defiling water, and every man has fallen into that well. And when Christ comes, what does he do? He shall save, he'll pull them out, save his people from their sins. Now, whenever Jesus saved anyone from sickness, the sickness will not remain not a trace not any part of that sickness will remain so if he saves from sickness and the sickness does not remain in any form in any shape even a little bit of the sickness will not remain the same thing when he saves from sin he shall save his people from their sins the sins will not remain when Jesus saves us from Satan and from the affliction of Satan and from all the pressures of Satan, a demon-possessed person, a person who is overcome by Satan, and then Jesus comes and he saves that man from the hand of Satan. That power of Satan and that oppression of Satan and that evil force of Satan will not remain in any form. If he says from sickness, sickness does not remain in the life of that man. If he saves from Satan, Satan's power, attack and affliction does not remain in the life of that man when he saves from sin. Sin will not remain in the mind, in the man or in the woman. You cannot say, I am saved, I am still sinning. You can't say that. I am prayed for by Christ. Christ has healed me. I am still sick. You cannot say that. Christ has delivered me from Satan. But Satan is still having authority over my life. You cannot say that. He will save. He will rescue, he will deliver, he will take out his people from their sins. That's the good news. And good news makes people happy. 
makes people joyful. What you couldn't do for yourself, what you couldn't achieve for yourself, good news has come. Christ, the mighty one, Christ, the Savior, the mighty Savior, he has come to save his people who are the people, the people who flock to him. The people who go to him, the people who repent as they come to him and they trust him and they believe him and they accept him fully and they say, Lord, here we come, save us. He saves them and their lives will never be the same again. The subject tonight, Jesus, the Savior from sin and all its consequences. Jesus, the Savior from sin and all its consequences. We're looking at this under three subtitles. Number one, the spotless Savior of all sinners. The spotless Savior of all sinners. Number two, the sinless sanctifier of all saints. And number three, the smitten succor of the sick. The smitten succor of the sick. Let's look at number one. Number one is the spotless Savior of all sinners. It tells us in Acts chapter 3 verse 26, it tells us, unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, that's the name, that's the name Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from, from, from his iniquities. And then he tells us in chapter 4 of Acts, Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We must be saved. There's no other name. All those names you've read in Matthew chapter 1, in Luke chapter 3, none other name, no Jewish name could save. And all the names of the Gentiles, none other name could save. Names in the past, names in the present, and names in the future. There is no other name by which any man can be saved. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from, from, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Look at verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, is the spotless Savior of all sinners. There are three things there. Number one, the prophecy fulfilled by Jesus as Savior. Number two, the purpose of full justification, our salvation. And then number three, the power of freedom through Jesus from all sins. Let's look at number one there in the prophecy. The, what we have read about in Matthew chapter 1. Look at Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he only he can do it for he the spotless one the sinless one the eternal one for he shall save his people from their sins verse 22 that tells us now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the lord by the prophet saying verse 23 it says behold the virgin shall be a child and shall bring forth a son a virgin not a woman a virgin somebody a woman who has never known a man, a virgin shall be our child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall 
call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is everybody, God with us. He came to fulfill prophecy. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. If you were the person, I say that God gave such a prophecy to a word. Tell it. Declare it. Tell everyone that a virgin shall conceive. Have you studied science? How can that be possible? Why don't you think of what you are saying before you say that? Have you studied human history? Has that ever taken place? A virgin shall conceive. Why don't you think through before you, you know, declare all these things? Do you know the possibility scientifically? Humanly speaking, do you know how possible it will be? That's the problem of many preachers, not here, but over there in the world. Whatever they cannot prove scientifically, and whatever they don't know how it will happen, they cannot declare a virgin shall conceive, a man shall be holy. A person shall be totally free from every stain, every spot, every defilement of sin. A man can be perfected by God. Be that perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Whatever they cannot prove, whatever they cannot, you know, analyze scientifically, they don't believe that God happened. When we talk about God, is able to do all things. He's able to fulfill whatever prophecy he has given. And so I say, not thinking about what anybody will say, not thinking about the possibility of fulfillment. He was not the one to do it. It was the almighty God that will do it. Therefore, he said it openly and he said it confidently. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Actually, I say I was not the first to say that it had been prophesied earlier by God himself in a different language but very clear in Genesis chapter 3 looking at verse 15 I will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed Everyone that is born into the world is referred to as the seed of the man. But this is going to be unique, distinct, different. This kind had never been, will never be until Christ and after Christ it will never be. It says her seed. It shall bruise thy head. That is when that seed of the virgin, when he comes, he'll bruise the head of the devil. And thou, devil, Satan, serpent, shall bruise his heel. The only thing you'll be able to do, Satan, is to crucify him and nail his feet on the wood, on the cross. And then... That will mean he'll knock you down and knock you out. He will defeat you. He'll defeat Satan for you. Luke chapter 1. We're reading from verse 30. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Now, angels don't question God 
when they are sent on a message. Go to Mary, tell her this. She, without knowing man, will be the mother of Christ, Jesus, my only begotten son. Angels will not say, Father, why Mary? Are there not other virgins? They won't ask any question. Angels will not say, why now? At the time God sends them, they go. And they go promptly. And they go and obey implicitly. And they obey without a question. That's why Jesus taught us and he said, Thy will be done on earth by kingdom citizens as it is done in heaven. When God gives you a message, when God sends you on an errand, you do it at the time he tells you to do it. You don't say, I wait for my own time. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Look at verse 31. It says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32. It says, He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest, not the son of Joseph, the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. In verse 33, it says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. That has not happened. He came the first time. He came to sacrifice for the sins of the whole world as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's coming the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will set up a kingdom and it will reign. That is still to happen. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Look at verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen? I know not a man. That confirms he was a virgin. And now they answer in verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, Christ is holy. Christ is righteous. Christ is spotless. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He came to fulfill prophecy. Number two here. In number two, we're looking at the purpose of full justification. That's our salvation. Why did he come? Look at Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 33. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, have I begotten thee, have I begotten thee. It's not a son of Joseph, it's a son of the almighty God. The God of heaven said, I have begotten thee. And then what did he come to do? Verse 38. In verse 38, be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Verse 39. It says by him all that believe. All that believe. Whether they are here or there. All that believe at that time or at this time all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law 
of Moses. Think about that now. All that believed are justified from all things, all their sins, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. When that justification comes, he makes us better, cleaner, more righteous than all the people of the Old Testament. Think about all of them. It says, all that could not be justified by the law of Moses in the Old Covenant, as we come to Christ in the New Covenant, the salvation, the justification, the renewal, the righteousness is higher and greater than that of the Old Testament. It tells us in Romans chapter 3, and reading from verse 24, it says, being justified freely, we don't have to bring an animal. We don't have to bring, uh, you know, sugar cane. We don't have to bring uh, any turtle or any kind of animal burn before the Lord. It says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That redemption, that forgiveness is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, it says, whom God has set for to be a propitiation through faith. In his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, remover, cleansing, freedom from sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. In verse 26, it tells us, it says to declare, I say, at this time, at this time, at this time, in this, our dispensation, it says to declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. He came to save his people from their sins, but then everyone has to come, repent, believe. In Jesus Christ. Number three here. In number three, the power of freedom through Jesus from all sins. The power of freedom from all sins. He sets us free. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 11, it says, and she said, no man, Lord, no man has been able to condemn her or throw a stone at her. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Have you noticed here that the woman appeared quiet, was not rolling on the ground, but Christ spoke the word. And any time Christ spoke the word against Satan, against sickness, always fulfilled. And when he spoke against sin, always fulfilled. The woman became free. And then we're told in verse 32, it says in verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then in verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. You are free. I am free. And it says, indeed, what's the difference between you shall be free and you shall be free indeed. That means examine him, examine her, examine every part, examine all the bondage of the past and all the sinfulness of the past. Christ now comes into his life, into our life and makes her free and she's free completely, entirely, and totally free for good. And whenever Satan comes with the old temptation, he'll say, you don't know you are coming to, I am not only free, I am free indeed. You are free indeed in Jesus' name. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 18. In Romans chapter 6, verse 18, 
being then made free from sin free from sin let's remember that illustration i gave that somebody fell into the well and the well has dirty water poisonous water that will destroy the skin of the person but now somebody came and brought that fellow out of the well and took all the dirty water that went into him pumped everything out the man is free the woman is free the same thing was salvation being then made free from sin ye became the servants of righteousness in verse 22 but now be made free from sin emphasize again ye became servants to god and ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life everlasting life will not come eternal life will not come if there's no freedom from sin the top part of the verse said being now made free from sin become you become there is a new creation and there is a new nature and there is a new lifestyle you become the servants to god and ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end and the goal and the achievement and the result is everlasting in life we're coming to point number two in point number two we're looking at the sinless sanctifier of all saints look at Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, remember, she shall bring forth a son, she shall bring forth a son, and that shall call his name Jesus, for he that Jesus will save all his people from their sins. Now, it doesn't limit the sins there that is going to save his people from. He'll save them from external sins. He'll save them from inbred sin. He'll save them from casual sin. He'll save them from common sin. He'll save them from habitual sinning. He'll save them from personal peculiar sins. It will save these people from their sins at salvation. We're saved from the outward external sin at sanctification, that inbred sin and the depraved nature and the thing that is in there that is uh, pulling people down, dragging people down. The salvation of Christ also covers that. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate is provided already look at verse 13 in verse 13 it says let us go forth therefore it's done it let's go to him it's provided it let's go to him is the sanctifier let us go to him that he might sanctify the people with his own blood let us go to him in consecration let us go to him with expectation let us go to him believing that he can do it let us go to him with laying everything on the altar and saying entirely completely absolutely i belong to you i will not look in any other direction you are my savior you are my lord you are my sanctifier you are my king you are my leader you are my controller i put everything in your hand let us go forth therefore unto him without the calm bearing its approach in verse 14 it says for here we have no continuing city but we we'll seek one to come in first john chapter 3 verse 5 it tells us first john chapter 3 verse 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin take away our sin he has taken away my sin 
Look at the way you are saying it. Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the provision of Emmanuel, our sanctifier. The provision of Emmanuel, our sanctifier. Number two, the passionate prayer of earnest saints. Number three, the possession of the entirely sanctified. Let's look at number one, the provision of Emmanuel, our sanctifier. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Look at the depth of the miracle working power of God. Look at the height of the miracle working power of God. Look at the length and the breadth of the miracle working power of God. A virgin shall be with child. It's never happened before that time. A virgin shall be with child, and then it happened. If that could happen, according to the promise God gave in the Old Testament, I want you to, when you get back home, look at promises God had given in the Old Testament and see how deep they are and see how impossible for man to have that fulfilled by himself. If God could give the promise, the prophecy, a virgin shall conceive, and it actually happened, every other promise will be fulfilled. And then it says, when he gives back to that child, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. That means the same God that saved us is still waiting there. He wants to do the next one. He wants to sanctify. He wants to do something seemingly impossible, incredible. He wants to sanctify the heart of man. And he's able to do it because he is Emmanuel, God with us. Look at Psalm 130, Psalm 130. Verse 7, Psalm 130. We're looking at verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, deep redemption, great redemption. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He shall redeem redeem Israel from all his iniquities. That's Emmanuel. He can do it. He will do it in Jesus' name. In Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what he can do. Let's say I was dormant, dead, like a dead log of wood. I wasn't moving. Nothing challenged me. I didn't have any fire, any passion, any zeal in me. And then it looks impossible for me to be able to raise myself up and have a zeal for good works. Emmanuel, our sanctifier, can get to me there. And then he speaks a word, and his word is like fire. And it gets into me. And then all the deadness in my nature, all the deadness in my constitution, all the deadness in my life, he takes away by a single stroke, by a single word. And then he purifies me to become a peculiar, unique person. And then he makes me zealous of good works. He can do it for every one of us. 
he will do it in your life we're looking at hebrews chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 9 it says in hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 but we'll see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And then in verse 10, it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. Bringing many sons unto glory. As you look at the descendants of Adam, the offspring of Adam, and everything is shameful. Look, look at their story in chapter 4 of Genesis. Look at their story in chapter 5 of Genesis. Look at their story in Genesis uh, chapter, chapter 6. Look at their story in, in Psalm 14. Look at their story in Psalm 53. Look at their story in Romans chapter 3. It's like everything is degenerate. Everything is defiled. Everything is dirty. Everything is shameful. But now he comes Christ and he is that Emmanuel our sanctifier and he brings many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings and then he tells us in verse 11 he says for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. He will not be ashamed of you. He will not be ashamed of you. Here on earth and up there in heaven, he will not be ashamed of us in Jesus' name. Let's come to number two there. Number two there is the passionate prayer of earnest saints. He wants to do that for us. But you know, salvation, if we're going to get salvation, we have to pray. We have to go to him. We have to show him we want that salvation. Not a so-so salvation. Not a make-believe salvation. Salvation that heaven will recognize and say, he is saved. Salvation that the Spirit of God will bear witness in the heart he is saved. The same thing for sanctification. We come, already we know about the prophecy of Christ. We know about the promise and provision of Christ. But now we come passionate in prayer. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, reading from verse 12. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I well, hearken unto you. I didn't hear your amen there. He will answer your prayer. I said he will answer your prayer. When you pray for healing for the body, the body that will go to the grave, he answers. When you pray for money, the money that will not be spent beyond the point of death, he answers your prayer. When you pray for marriage, life partner, the life partner that is just for us here because there's no marriage in heaven. He answers your prayer. When you pray for children, like Anna prayed for a child, the Lord answers prayer. He will answer your prayer. If you pray for those other things and God answers, when you pray for this sanctification that takes us right to the presence of God in heaven, he answered all the other prayers, he will answer this one. Look at Buster Tina in Buster Tina, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It will do it for you. Let's come to number three here. Number three, the possession of entire sanctification. Possession of entire sanctification and look at first john chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 3 in first john chapter 3 verse 3 and every man that has 
this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure purifies himself that doesn't mean you will not pray you just do it and try your luck by yourself if you're going to purify yourself it means to take yourself to the purifier to the sanctifier and to the one that is able to make you clean and pure and righteous and holy within and without whiter than snow as you take yourself to him and you stay there and you abide there i will not let you go except you sanctify me that work of grace will be done in your life it will be done in your soul, in your spirit, in your body, it will be done in Jesus' name. Chapter 4, verse 17. Chapter 4, first John, chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is a love made perfect. You know, we know that love is very important. Love one another as I have loved you, that the world may believe that the Father have sent me. This is the new commandment he has given unto us, brethren. Let us not love in word only, but in deed and in truth. A kind of love, agape love, the love of God in our heart, shared abroad by the Holy Ghost now. We know that when we are born again, we love God, we love one another. But the love is up and down sometimes we're on the valley sometimes we're on the mountain top sometimes the love depends on the happenings around us when we're happy we love when we're not too happy and we're thinking about something our thinking will give us some sinking feeling and then we don't love so much but then when it comes in our hearts and it purges our heart. And our life does not depend on the happenings of the day. Our lives do not depend on what we see, or what we feel, or what we think, or what people do, or what people do not do. Then he perfects the love. And he does that because he is Emmanuel. He has all the power. And when we pray unto him, he'll fulfill it in Jesus' name. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Look at this. Because as he is, so are we not when we get to heaven in this world as he is love always flowing look at jesus look at his love he had been beating they approached a crown of thorns on his head he even fell down under uh, the you know under the cross but then he knew all that will happen and before the, he got to that situation in the garden some of the people came to arrest him and peter said you not do that while I'm here. And he threw the sword and he cut up the ear. But you see, Jesus Christ, the love always flowing, always there. Even though he faced betrayal, the love always there. He faced all the beating and the scourging. The love was still always there. He bent down and took that ear and performed the miracle and fixed up the ear.